Hi, I'm Cindy Bornt. I'm the orthopedic nurse practitioner at Samaritan Hospital. Today we're going to talk about total joint replacement, both hip replacement and knee replacement. Total hip arthroplasty, also called total hip replacement, begins with an incision to allow access to the bones of the hip joint. The next step is to remove damaged cartilage and bone from the acetabulum, the cup-shaped hollow in the pelvic bone. This damage results from the bones rubbing directly against each other when protective cartilage wears away. A tool called a reamer is used to prepare the acetabulum to receive the socket portion of the hip replacement. This metal and plastic combination is called the acetabular component and is fitted into the newly reamed bone surface. The outer metal part of this component, sometimes called a cup, fits directly into the socket. The inner plastic portion has a hollow to hold the replacement for the ball-shaped bone at the top of the thigh bone, or femur. The outer metal part is rough to help bone grow into its surface over time to lock the artificial socket in place. The next step is removing the ball-shaped head of the femur, or thigh bone, and preparing the femur for placement of the stem portion of the component. A metal ball is attached to the end of the stem and fits into the artificial socket in the hip bone. Together, these components replace the natural ball and socket joint. During and after surgery, the surgeon verifies the correct fit and range of motion of the hip replacement components. By mimicking the anatomy and functioning of the natural hip joint, hip replacement can reduce pain and permit a return to many activities. Total knee arthroplasty or replacement is a surgical procedure in which a diseased or damaged knee joint is replaced with an artificial joint. Your knee is made up of the lower end of your thigh bone or femur the upper end of the shin bone, or tibia, and the kneecap, or patella. Most replacement joints consist of a metal femoral component, a plastic tibial component held in a metal tray, and a plastic patellar component. The procedure begins with an incision on the front of the knee, and the kneecap is moved to the side. Damaged bone and cartilage at the end of the femur are cut away, and the bone is measured and cut to fit into the femoral component, which is then attached. Next, damaged bone and cartilage at the top of the tibia are cut away, and the bone is measured and cut to fit into the tibial component. A metal tray is fit against the flat cut top of the bone with its stem inserted into the bone. A plastic insert is snapped into the tibial tray. The femoral component slides on it when the knee is bent. The damaged portion of the kneecap may be replaced by a mushroom-shaped prosthesis. The resectioned patella and prosthesis are attached to other components. Measurements and tests to ensure balance and movement are done during and after surgery. Knee replacement can significantly reduce pain and improve function. Like all surgery, there are associated risks. Physical therapy and realistic expectations are important for successful recovery. Our objectives for today are how to prepare for surgery, what to expect the day of surgery, what to expect postoperatively, and during your post-op stay. You'll be also be talking to or being heard from um, physical therapy and occupational therapy, which will see you every day of your hospitalization in a private appointment. We don't do group lessons with our physical therapy. Um, you'll have a private appointment with them, and sometimes, depending upon your need, you'll see them twice in a day. Discharge planning will see you as well. Um, I'll go over the rehab process. We try to send you home if at all possible because it really um, aids to your development. Um, and then I'll go over what you should need to do when you're home and the equipment that you'll need. Any equipment that you need will be provided by us. I'll write a script. Usually I have it delivered to your house. Um, all patients will have COVID testing in this COVID era. Um, 
you will have an appointment to get your COVID test. It is imperative that you actually have the COVID test performed. Your, ske your scheduled surgery will be rescheduled if you arrive for your surgery without the COVID test. We cannot do rapid testing um, for um, pre-admission patients. They're only done emergently. So once again, when you have that appointment for your COVID test, make sure that it is at a time and place where you can make it because we will not do your surgery without it. Pre-admission testing. Um, secondary to the COVID vaccine, the COVID pandemic um, will be conducted as a phone interview from our PAT team. Um, it is instead of a face-to-face -face meeting that it used to be. We will still collect all the necessary information. You'll need to know all of your medications, all of your allergies, who is your primary um, physician, as well as any specialists such as pulmonologists and cardiology services. When you come to the hospital for your surgery you'll come to the lally pavilion it is on people's avenue halfway between 15th street and burdett avenue there is a sign that says lally pavilion l-a-l-l-y there is a large stonework entranceway and a large um, door sliding glass door that you come through you come in there's a desk in front of you if you have any questions you can ask the woman at the desk she's very friendly and then you take a right go to the end of the short hallway take a quick left and the elevators are directly on your left. Take the elevators down to the basement, come out, take a le quick left, and pre-admission testing is right in front of you. There are offices both on the left and the right. There are signs up on the ceiling that say pre-admission testing. There is a surgical waiting room on the left. During this COVID pandemic, we are not allowing visitors to stay during surgery. Your um, person will have to, can come into the hospital with you, but will have to leave after you're entered into pre-admission testing. And then they can wait in their car. The surgeon will certainly call them at the end of your surgery. In preparation for your surgery, you'll be given a guidebook. Um, it has all of the information that you really need to know and places to jot down notes for yourself in the guidebook. You should certainly bring it to your doctor's appointments as well as bring it to the hospital when you come for your surgery. Things to do before surgery. So before surgery, um, you should not shave for a week before b below the neckline. We do many, many things to prevent you from getting infection. Infection is one of the worst possible outcomes of having any surgery at all. We all have bacteria on our skin. We all have bacteria in our nose. And our job is to, we can't sterilize your skin. We certainly can't put you in a sterilizer. So what we do is we try to kill off as much bacteria that already resides on your skin before we start doing your surgery. To do that, there's no shaving. Shaving causes little tiny microscopic um, cuts in your skin. And that allows the bacteria that lives on your skin to crawl in there. And once it's in under your skin, we can't kill it. So no shaving from the neck down. We'll also send you um, some ointment to put on the inside of your nose. This is called Bactroban or Miraprocin, and it kills most of the normal bacteria that lives on your skin. You put it on twice a day. You can put it on a Q-tip, you can put it on your finger, and then you just put it on the inside of your nose and around the outside of, your, of the opening of your nostril. This will kill the bacteria so that you can't transfer bacteria from your nose to your skin just in normal daily activities. Um, you'll also get some hexagon baths. Um, the night before surgery, you'll take a hexagon bath. The hexagon is, a, is like a soap that is antibacterial and it will kill the, the bacteria that are all over your skin. And then you'll change your sheets. You need new sheets, new pajamas. In the morning, you'll take another hexagon bath and then you'll come to the hospital. When you come to the hospital, you should um, once again have your list of medications just because everybody is going to ask you again about your medications. You are going to get very tired of people asking you the same questions. I apologize, but the truth is if there is an error in your record and I go by your record, I will just continue that error through your entire hospital course and obviously that would be dangerous. So every single person that talks to you is going to ask you the same questions just to verify the information that yes is already in your record. But as you know, mistakes are made, things are typed wrong. I think it's probably the most important thing that we do for your safety is to verify everything about you. So bring a list of your medications. Now 
When we say medications, I'm not talking just the medications that are prescribed by your doctor. I'm also talking about herbals, teas, um, whether you use CDB oil, whether you take fish oil. Fish oil is really important because in some surgeries, fish oil can cause you to bleed a little bit more. So if you've been taking fish oil, I want to know because I need to know that I need to watch you for a little bit more bleeding than someone else. And if you bleed a little bit more than someone else, then I know why. Um, as well as, um, once again, all the, all the specialists that you see, okay? We need to know what your medical history is. That's also very important to keep you safe. As far as smoking and alcohol, um, the less you smoke, the better you'll do. Smoking creates more bacteria on your skin. Smoking decreases the amount of oxygen that gets to the surgical site because the nicotine displaces the oxygen. So it, your tissue is going to get nicotine instead of oxygen. So everything that you can do to either quit, Chantix, you know, whatever you could do, that would be fabulous. Knowing that many people don't want to quit and their, their surgery may be scheduled not in really time enough to really quit. Um, what I ask is that you don't smoke within 12 hours of surgery. I know that is hard. I know that is hard, but you know what? You're, not, you're also not gonna be able to eat your breakfast. So as much as you can eat your breakfast and you can not have a cigarette, I understand that that is not the best situation for many people, but that is what will keep you safe. Um, if you do have to smoke, smoke as minimally as you can. Um, Post-operatively, you're not allowed to smoke in the hospital. Postoperatively, if you need to, I will order you some nicotine patches so that you have nicotine replacement if the withdrawal from the nicotine is severe. I try to send you home the next day, so hopefully it won't be too much of a problem for you. But even postoperatively, please try not to smoke as much as you're used to, just to aid in your own healing. Um, in the morning, you will be um, not able to eat your breakfast. Some surgeons allow you to have clear liquids until in sips until your surgery, but we don't allow any hard candy. We don't allow any chewing gum. For all intents and purposes, you will not have anything to drink, anything to eat the morning of surgery. And that goes from midnight the night before. When you get to the surgical area, an IV will be started by your nurse and um, we will give you fluids so that you're not feeling as dry. You can also have um, the small swab sticks, they have a sponge on them. They soak them in water and let you wet, wet your mouth and wet your lips, but you're not allowed to actually drink anything or even have ice chips. In the morning when you get up, you can certainly brush your teeth and rinse. We ask you not to gargle um, because it does displace bacteria down your throat and can cause some irritation. Also when you come in, you should bring, if you're a workman's comp, you should bring your comp case number and your contact number for your contact person. And that's mostly for billing, to make sure your billing is correct so that you don't end up with some bill that you don't need to have and cause a lot more frustration on your part, as well as for discharge planning. If you do indeed need to go to rehab, they will need that information because your, your rehab will stay will also be covered by your workman's compensation. If at all possible, you should de designate a person to be your coach. This is usually the same person that is in the car when they drop you off, although it may not be. Um, but this person is the one that if there's concerns, I can call or your surgeon can call um, or any of the specialists can call. They're there to provide more information, provide you with support. Um, help us plan your post-op course and your discharge course. So it's very important that you choose the correct person to be your coach. Um, they should be easily accessible to you and someone that you trust with all of your information. Also, before surgery, you need to decide upon advanced directives. No one really likes to discuss dir advanced directives but you need to have someone designated to make decisions in case you are unable to make decisions. Um, very rarely do we have 
complications with surgery that make you unable, but it does happen rarely. And in that instance, you, we need to know what your thoughts are regarding your care should you become incapable of deter telling us yourself. So that is a very important thing to do. You'll also need medical clearance. Um, that should come from your primary care provider, so you are going to have to you know, get that from your primary care provider, which usually is uh, an appointment of some, some sort, whether it's an online appointment or a Zoom appointment or a telephone appointment so that they can send us verification that the benefit of surgery outweighs the risk of surgery. You may, depending upon your medical history, also need cardiac clearance, pulmonary clearance. If you have a bleeding disorder, we may need hematology clearance. Um, but we need to have all those in order in order for your to surgery to go on as scheduled. The day before surgery, you will call PATs to determine your time of surgery. The time of surgery usually isn't determined until after 12, and the number that you would call would be 518-271-3339. Once again, that's 518-271-3339. When you pack to come to the hospital, as I said, I'm planning on sending you home the next day for most intents and purposes or to rehab. Do bring like sneakers, shoes that are comfortable, that have a good sole with traction. We do have the hospital slippers, you know, the socks that have the little sticky things so that you don't slide around. But I, if, but I would recommend that you do bring a shoe that ties or buckles and has a good traction like a sneaker. Also maybe some sweatpants or some shorts that are loose um, and just you know a t-shirt, maybe a sweater, um, but those would be the things that you should bring just so that you're comfortable. If you don't bring them it's fine. We have pajama pants, we have hospital gowns. The hospital gowns are open in the back but they do tie um, so we can keep you covered and we can keep you comfortable, but if you prefer your own clothing and a good pair of shoes, certainly feel free to bring them. Bring your personal care items. If you're on CPAP at home, certainly bring your CPAP machine. Um, we will take good care of it, but um, it's very important that if you're on CPAP at home that you're on CPAP at night in our hospital, especially when I have you on pain medication so that you breathe easily. The day of surgery. You'll report to the ambulatory surgery at the Lally Pavilion, go down the basement, go to the ambulatory surgery desk, you check right in. Um, as I said, once the surgery is finished, the surgeon will call your coach or whoever dropped you off. We, we, the nurses will have you provide that information of who it is. We put it on a special sheet so that nobody misses it, so that we actually call the right person. In the pre-op area, so once you get there, the pre-op area is fairly cold. The nurses can give you a warm blanket if you're cold. We have, we have a warmer, we have tons of warm blankets. I don't want you cold. I'd rather that you were warm. And you're going to meet the pre-admission nurse. She'll take care of you pre-operatively. She'll put your IV in. She'll ask you all the questions. Fill out the chart. You'll see the, anes the anesthesiologist. The anesthesiologist is going to go over how they plan to give you anesthesia, whether they're going to give you how this, the anesthesiologist is going to tell you how he is going to give you anesthesia, whether it be full sedation, whether he's also going to give you a block, how it's going to work, how long it should last. Blocks tend to last a varying period of time. My best advice is that when that block starts to wear off, you tell your nurse, so that she can start giving you pain medicine. But the anesthesiologist is the total director of all of your anesthesia during that time. While you're in the pre-op area, you're going to have another chlorhexidone wash to the affected area, the operative site. You will also have the site identified. You'll be asked to identify it yourself as well as the surgeon, and the surgeon will put his initials on the site. You will not be able to have surgery if this is not done. So the surgeon will see you, he will put his John Hancock on your hip or on your knee, and then all will go well. But I just want you to know that is why he initials it.
to make sure that we have the correct, the correct site. And you are asked to confirm that just to make sure that we keep you safe and we have the correct site for your surgery. So it's very important that you are able to tell us what site it is. So after your site is marked, um, anesthesia and your nurse will usually bring you into the room. In the operating room, people think it is quiet. It is not quiet going through the hallways usually. Once you get in the room, it's fairly busy. It is very bright. It, there are a lot of lights because we need to see what we're doing obviously. There's a lot of lights. It's very, very cold. And that is because we have a lot of equipment that heats up as well as everyone there is dressed in extra gowns and extra clothing which makes them hot. So the nurses will give you warm blankets. They will cover you in warm blankets. Anesthesia will put on this air blanket and frequently you will have the air blanket in pre-op just to keep you warm. Bodies do better if they're warm with surgery so we want to keep you warm. The bear hugger feels wonderful just so that you know. It feels wonderful. It reminds you of when you were a little kid and your mom used to get you out of the tub. It's warm and cozy. Um, bask in that because it really is nice. And more importantly, there have been some studies that show if we keep you warm, you'll have less chance of getting infection. Postoperatively, you'll be woken up gradually. The anesthesiologist will be talking to you. Um, by the time you're actually awake, the tube will be out of your throat. You'll still have your IV. Some people are a little confused at first, but that wears away. Um, you'll immediately be given pain medicine through your intravenous line and you'll be taken to the recovery room. In the recovery room, also called PACU, you'll have close monitoring. You'll have stickies on your chest, they'll be watching your heart, you'll have a clip on your finger so they can watch your oxygenation. You'll have oxygen either on a mask or in the nasal cannula that goes up your nose. They'll also ask you about your pain. Be very specific regarding your pain. We can control your pain. We cannot take all of your pain away. You need to know that. All of your pain will not be taken away, but we can make your pain tolerable. We did surgery. You're going to have some pain. My job is to make sure that you have enough pain control so that you can get out of bed and ambulate and do the things that you need to do in order to go home. If I give you too much pain medication, you will not be able to do that because you'll be droopy and floppy. And if you're droopy and floppy, I can't get you up. So what I'm looking for is pain management somewhere between the two so that you're tolerant but not incapacitated. I can't have you too droopy to get up. Um, but I don't want you writhing in pain. If you're writhing in pain, I still can't get you up. So we're looking for somewhere along that line. There is a pain um, chart that the nurses use. It graduates your pain from one to 10, 10 being writhing in pain and you can't even speak, one obviously being you know, not much at all, not requiring anything. I would expect that we should be able to keep your pain somewhere around a five, anywhere between the range of four and six. Um, but I'm aiming for the five. Most people, if I have their pain at five, are able to do the activities that we need you to do in order to be discharged. Um, you're not too sleepy and you're not writhing and that's what I'm looking for. And it's very important that we attain that. Your average stay usually in PACU runs about one to three hours depending upon how fast you wake up and how stable your vital signs are. And then you'll go to the fifth floor for um, the rest of your care. The fifth floor at Samaritan Hospital is in the pavilion. It's that new area. It is beautiful. You have your own private bathroom. It's large, it's spacious, it has a shower. You have your own nurse. You have a private room. All the bedrooms are private. They all have large windows. It's bright, it's cheery. I will warn you that for some reason the sinks go on at night all by themselves. Don't let it scare you. They just kind of run to keep the water supply. I don't really understand it, but th they do go on. They scared my husband. <laughs> but uh, but they're, they're, they don't usually wake you up. You will also, um, 
the pain management part piece of your post-op stay is the most important um, for you and for us. We need to get you to that five. If, if the pain medicine that you're receiving isn't getting you there, if you really feel like you, you need different pain medicine, you, you tell your nurse, your nurse will call me, I will fix it um, to the best of my ability without, of course, making you too sleepy. But there are very other ways that you don't have to really worry so much about becoming um, sleepy. Ice, ice is your friend. If your joint swells, and, and they do postoperatively, some swelling is normal just from the insult of surgery, but if it swells too much, it's going to put pressure on the nerves. And if you get pressure on the nerves and the tissues, you're going to have more pain. So the nurses will bring you ice packs. Keep the ice packs on. I usually have them bring you two. I have them tie them together. If they're on your knee, we tie them together so that they stay there. The same thing with your hip. You'll get two ice packs. One will be a little bit posterior towards the back. One will be more towards the front. But ice does a great job in helping you with your pain. I know people kind of just kind of roll their eyes about ice, but truly ice is your best friend. You'll have the ability to have pain medication every four hours. I order a variety of pain medications um, depending upon your personal situation, um, how your body works, how your kidney function is, whether you're a diabetic. Um, I am the one who will, who will titrate your pain medicine to help you get through this. If your pain is not being managed well enough, you need to communicate that with your nurse. That's the most important thing is to communicate with your nurse. We have very good nurses. Um, they, will, they will call me. Don't you worry. One of us will take care of your pain. We'll also check your blood sugar. Um, despite the fact that you're not a diabetic, more often if you are, usually we check the blood sugar in PACU just to make sure that it's okay. Um, but if you're a diabetic, we'll check your blood sugar regularly. That too is to prevent infection. If your blood sugar is high, um, you're more apt to get an infection. The implants that we use. So um, hip and knee implants, they're all made of titanium or cobalt chromium um, and tantalum. They're very sturdy. They also have ceramic and polyethylene. They are likely to set off airport detectors. So if you're going to travel, you should warn them that yes, indeed, you do have a, a hip replacement. Um, with their metal detectors, they'll be able to tell. Um, during your stay up on the, on the fifth floor, you'll see physical therapy and occupational therapy, and that's when your discharge planner will also see you. Um, if you're a workman's comp, once again, bring that information with you. Some insurances, um, do not cover rehabilitation. So it, it would be in your best interest to check with your own insurance company and see what your benefit is regarding rehabilitation so that when you come in, it's not a surprise and the copay for it is not a surprise. As I said, I prefer to send you home if at all possible, um, but I cannot send 24 seven help to your house. I can provide you with a commode, a walker, I can, um, have physical therapy come to your house, but I cannot provide 24-7 care. So if you need care or you're not able to um, be discharged safely, then you'll, you'll need to go to rehab. And in order to do that, um, many forms will have to be filled out, financial forms. So you need to have some idea of what your insurance covers and what your copay will be going in. The rehab process, in order to be discharged home, you need to be able to get in and out of bed independently with your walker or your crutches and get to the bathroom and back. You'll also need to do stairs. Whether you have stairs at home or not, I make you do two to four stairs just so that you know how to do them and then you're comfortable with them. If you're unable to do those things, I will, I will feel that it is necessary for you to go to rehab. Um, because I don't want to send you home and then have you fail just because your mobility isn't up to par. 
the rehab process doesn't really go the way most people think it, think it does. How it works is there are representatives from all of the rehab facilities in our area that come to the hospital every day. They will um, talk to the discharge planner, they'll look at my notes, they'll talk to physical therapy. Then if they feel that you're compatible with the program that they offer, they will offer a bed to you if they have a bed available. Once a bed is offered to you, you have to make your choice within 24 hours. Depending upon the number of beds that are offered, you choose the one that you want to go to out of those offers. You may want to look into, if you're anticipating that you'll go to rehab, you may want to look into the rehab facilities in your area just so you know, have some idea of what's available to you and where you might want to go should they have a bed available. But the rehab process starts on admission. So someone is looking at your chart, our discharge planners start looking at your chart the day that you're admitted and we try to guess ahead about who we're going to be looking for a bed for so that we can um, take a bed as soon as, as, soon as we can. Um, we like to be on top of that. Post-operative complications. The worst post-operative complication is to get an infection. An infection in your total joint is life-changing. You'll require more surgery, you'll require IV antibiotics. So everything that we can do to stop infection is imperative. Hence, we don't let you shave, you have all the antibacterial baths, you have the ointment up your nose. We also, place a waterproof dressing on your joint. The waterproof dressing is sterile. It has an absorbent central area. It kind of acts as like one of the super absorbent diapers so that many people will leak a little bit of fluid or a little bit of blood out of their joint with movement. It will absorb that so that it can't be um, food for bacteria. Bacteria like blood in body secretions, they thrive on it, so it absorbs it so that that isn't a food source for the back, any bacteria. That dressing, because it's placed on, a, on as close to a sterile joint as we can get, and is sterile, that will stay in place until your follow-up appointment with your surgeon, which is in usually two weeks. It is waterproof, so you can shower. You cannot submerge, you cannot go in a tub bath, a hot tub, or a pool. It will come off in those instances, but it is very safe and very sticky and it will stay on during a regular shower. Um, if it starts to peel off or if for some reason um, it needs to be changed, you can call your doctor and go to their office or to their urgent care and they will change that dressing for you. You will also be placed on some, some type of medication to prevent blood clots. The types of medication to prevent blood clots vary doctor to doctor and person to person depending upon what your risk is to get a blood clot. Um, it varies anywhere from shots into your abdomen to pills that you take. Um, if you're on Coumadin for a cardiac problem, we will stop that ahead of time and then I'll restart it and, and actually give you other medication to make your blood thinner until your Coumadin kicks back in. But that will all be ordered by your, your surgeon himself. It is important that you are compliant with um, medications that prevent you from getting a clot because when we do surgery, especially with a joint, your body's initial response is to clot. It wants to fix any bleeding. So your body increases all of its ways to, to make you clot. We have to combat that so that you don't get a clot in your leg. Um, obviously, if you get a clot in your leg, that can travel to your heart, can travel to your brain, can travel to your lung, and not only be deadly, it can change your whole life. So you will be ordered medications to anywhere from a baby aspirin twice a day to a shot in your stomach um, to prevent the clots, and it's important that you are compliant with that. If cost of the therapy to prevent blood clots is an issue, um, you need to discuss that with me or my or whoever is covering me so that we can put give you something that is affordable and that you are comfortable with taking. Otherwise, you're, we're also at risk for pneumonia 
and um, respiratory issues. I like to know in advance if you're an asthmatic or if you have a history of COPD or any type of respiratory problem so that it's well documented in your chart. If there's any issues, I will have a pulmonologist see you. Otherwise, we will give you an incentive spirometer. It's this little plastic toy and it has a little tube off of it and what you do is you put your mouth on it and then you suck in slow and as deep as you can, almost like you were seven years old and you're sucking up a milkshake. You just put it in your mouth and you slowly until you really can't take another breath and then you blow it out. It has a little gauge on the side of it. The nurse will put on, put, there's a little indicator which shows according to your height and weight where you should be able to um, increase your lung volume to and that, that will be your goal. I recommend that you do that three times an hour or if the television is on, do it once a commercial. Have it right in your bed. Don't put it on the bedside table. When I come to visit you, I will hand it to you and put it in your bed because if it's right there by your hand and you're watching TV, every time there's a commercial, you do that incentive spirometer, we won't have any problems with any pneumonia. Also, constipation. I will automatically order a stool softener for you. Um, the medications that we give you for pain, the opiates, they are very constipating and it is not the same constipation as um, dietary constipation. So we try to avoid it. I'll give you a stool softener right off the bat. You'll go home with a stool softener um, prescription as well. But if the stool softener is not enough, you need to just tell me and I can order some medication to, to help you move along. Early ambulation, getting out of bed and walking around is the best thing that you can do for all of these problems. Out of bed, walking will prevent blood clots, will prevent pneumonia, will prevent constipation. So the earliest that we get you up and get you moving, the better you will do. We will try to get you up the night of surgery. And I know that sounds daunting, but the sooner we get you up, the better you will do. So I will write an order for you to be out of bed. Unless there's a physical reason why the nurses cannot get you up, you will be out of bed at least to the chair, if not walking around the room. You can have pain medicine to make sure that you can do it, but we will get you up. You'll get up again for the morning. You will, can expect that when I come to see you in the morning, you will be up out of bed for breakfast. You are at great risk to fall. So between the pain medicine and having a new joint and requiring aids to ambulate, you are at risk to fall. So as much as I want you out of bed and walking, I don't want you out of bed alone walking. I want a nurse or an aide to assist you. Um, just turn on your light if you want to go for a walk. We have aides, we have nurses, we have nursing students, we have someone that can help you walk. Um, I am very happy if when I get there, you are walking. And you will be too, because once again, it prevents all those complications. Hello, my name's Mark Van Leuven. I'm one of the physical therapists at Samaritan Hospital. Today we're gonna to talk about your total joint replacement, what to do before your surgery, and what to expect while you're in the hospital with regard to physical therapy. So before your surgery, there are some things you can do to help yourself out. The stronger you are going into surgery, the better off you're gonna be, okay? The first thing you can start with is your arms, okay? Your arms are gonna be an important component as they're gonna help support you as you use your walker or crutches. Most people will use a walker, but either way, you're gonna need that extra arm strength to help support your body to protect your joint. The, other, the next piece will be your leg exercises. The stronger you can be with your hip or your knee that you're gonna have surgery on, the better. That doesn't mean you have to force pain before you come in, but the more repetitions, the more strength you have within that pain-free range of motion and exercise tolerance, the better. Another thing you can do is to just walk, you know, 10 to 15, 20 minutes, many, perhaps multiple times a day as you can tolerate it, but just to build up your endurance. Surgery is gonna take a lot out of your body. We're gonna ask you to be moving early and it's gonna help you if you have better endurance going into that process. A Couple things you can do before you come into the hospital to make returning home easier, okay? Prepare, your, prepare the space. On the floors, you wanna to try to remove all uh, throw rugs, making sure they're trip hazards. You don't wanna catch those on your walker. 
You want to see what kind of chairs do you sit in? Do you sit on the couch? Do you sit in a chair? The firmer the surface can be, the better it is. A good firm chair with good armrests will be easier to get up and down from. Sometimes the couch is softer, maybe a little tougher, but if that's where you sit, you want to take into consideration how hard is it going to be to get up and down. Recliner, the same type of thing. Recliners are okay, but sometimes they're a little lower. What you can do sometimes is take an extra cushion from your couch and double it up, so you raise that up a little bit higher if you need to. Um, but you want to make sure you have a good firm surface that's high enough that you're going to be able to get up and down off of. Um, you don't need a specific special bed. You don't necessarily need a hospital bed. Uh, you, you, you should be able to get in and out of your bed easily when you get home. The toughest part may be raising your leg up and down, but those are things that we're going to help you with when you're in um, after your surgery. We'll discuss strategies to help you do that. Cooking. Not everybody's going to want to cook. If you live by yourself or you don't have the means to do that, you want to maybe prepare meals ahead of time so that you can just, you know, use the microwave as opposed to having to stand in the kitchen and cook meals. Um, personal preference just depends, but it's something to consider. Uh, if you have pets, uh, if you have a very active dog that needs to go out a lot, you may want to consider having that, having somebody else watch that dog. So just things to think about with regard to pets because they can certainly be another trip hazard if they're anxious. They'll be happy to see you when you get home. Uh, any handrails that you could that you think you may need, uh, if you don't, if you have some steps that don't have handrails, you could pop things in the door frame or up. Potentially have somebody install those ahead of time. Um, you know, just take a look at those things and those aspects to make sure that you've thought about it so that you're not rushing when you get back home to try to fix those things. So now let's talk about when you're in the hospital, okay? The day of the surgery, depending on the timing of your surgery, uh, a physical therapist is likely going to try to see you in the evening, okay? Certainly it's, it's going to be dependent on how your recovery is going. Everybody's going to recover a little differently um, after surgery. But we're going to come in, introduce ourselves, we'll coordinate your pain medicine with the nursing staff, uh, and we'll just do a bedside evaluation to start. We'll talk about what to expect, show you exercises, start to go through that, um, and then if you're able, we'll, we'll get you out of bed. The goal is to have you out of bed for all meals and moving as much as possible, okay? The therapist will be in twice a day to see you. They'll go through those exercises each time. They'll be talking to you about your home uh, environment. What stairs do you have to enter your house? Do you have stairs once you're inside your house? Where do you sleep? What kind of um, bathtub you have? Uh, where your toilet is located? Are there bars in your bathroom? All those kinds of things with regard to your specific environment. Uh, we'll be discussing how to get in and out of your car. What kind of car do you have? What's the best strategy to do that, depending on whether or not you have had a hip or a knee? Um, we will review, if you've had a hip, we will review your total hip precautions, okay? Not bringing your knee above your hip or bending over, not crossing your legs or adducting your legs, and also not rotating your leg in specifically for your hip. You don't have to write those down or worry about that now. That's something that we will review over and over and over again. <laughs> um, clothing. Hospital gowns are not necessarily the most comfortable things to be walking around in. So if you have loose fitting t-shirts, shorts, sweatpants, uh, those are certainly things that you can bring in that you may feel more comfortable being in, you know, the second day after your surgery as you start moving around a little bit more. The exercises that you have, um, especially for knees and hips, but most specifically for knees, um, some of the things you want to do are keep your leg elevated. Um, ice is going to be your best friend. You can use ice. We'll have ice for you. Um, it will be there to protect your skin as well. There will be a little covering. Um, there are, there's the Ice Man, which is a, you know, kind of a cooler that comes around and surrounds your joint. If you don't have the means for that, you can also make your own ice with a combination of alcohol and water. If you do that, you want to make sure you double up the ice bags because sometimes they can leak, especially if you don't close the Ziploc just right. So doubling up on that will make sure that those don't leak. But they do work. It's almost like a gel pack that will fit around your leg a little bit easier. 
The most important thing with regard to your motion and your, your knee is making sure that you keep moving after surgery. To get full extension, which is the straightening of your knee, we don't want you to lay in bed with your leg elevated and pillows under your knee with your knee bent. We want your knee to be as straight as possible. Now, it doesn't have to be there for hours on end. Nobody's going to lay in one position for hours. The more you change position, the better it's going to feel. But certainly there's going to be stiffness there. And if you don't get that extension, it's going to be tougher in the long run. So the, your range of motion is something that we're going to focus on, both flexion or bending and extension or straightening. And the more you move, the better it's going to feel. That initial movement is certainly going to hurt. The surgery is not a minor surgery, it's a big surgery, and it is not going to be pain-free. But we, we will work very closely with the physician, the surgeon, and the nursing staff to make sure that your pain is controlled as good as it possibly can be. For your part, what you can do is make sure that you keep yourself moving as much as possible and doing your exercises and not staying in one position for too long. Okay, That's really important and also not supporting your leg when it's elevated with pillows underneath, but let your knee, you know, gravity will help to give it that stretch. Okay, so those are some really important factors as you go through. Uh, we're gonna talk about assistive devices, okay? Walkers, front walkers with a front wheel is something that is very common and the most common thing that you'll use when you're in the hospital and likely be issued for home. Crutches is something that sometimes people use you really need more balance for that. If you're used to the crutches and you want to use those, we'll certainly assess your ability to do so and don't have a problem with it if you're safe with completing your walking with the crutches. But most people feel more stable and a little more balanced with the walker. If you have your own walker and you want to bring it in, that's totally fine. You want to make sure you label that heavily with um, name tags and tape and things like that so it doesn't get mistaken for one of ours at the hospital. If you don't have a walker, we'll certainly issue you one and we'll work with your insurance to make sure that that is approved. There's sometimes a copay with that, which we'll work on getting um, at the hospital before you go. Um, if you have a walker to borrow, that's also okay, but we would ask that you bring that in just so that we can make sure it's fit to the proper height for your use and not the person's use that it was before. That sums it up. Uh, don't be scared of this surgery, but be prepared and be ready uh, to do the work. Um, and we'll go from there. Good luck, and we look forward to seeing you. Hi, my name is Brittany Mangione, and I'm one of the occupational therapists at Samaritan Hospital. So I'm here to talk a little bit about um, your daily routine at the hospital, what you can expect, and what you can expect for occupational therapy services and how we can help you post-surgery. So for your daily routine, when you're in the hospital, you will have a whiteboard. And that whiteboard will have a couple details and some information for you for your day. Um, some of the types of things on there will be, you know, your nurse, your tech. Sometimes we have your therapist names on there. Um, that doesn't always happen, but we will be in throughout the day. Um, you'll have your expected discharge date and today's date and also your plan of care for the day. Um, another thing that we would like is for patients to be up out of bed at least for every meal. Um, if not, maybe you're walking to the bathroom, walking a little bit in your room or in the hallways, but at least if you can get out of bed for every meal, that's going to help be helpful for you after your recovery. Um, and another thing, when you are packing for the hospital, if you can bring some loose fitting clothing, we're going to be practicing for occupational therapy how to get dressed. And you might be a little more comfortable um, just wearing some of your personal clothing as well um, along with the hospital gown, especially if you are walking in the hallways. Um, and also, um, I'm trying to think, bring some sturdy shoes with you too. Um, you can bring slip on shoes, but again, make sure that there's a sturdy back. We don't want any flip flops because that could pose a tripping hazard. So next, I'm going to be talking about occupational therapy, what occupational therapy is and how we can help you after you have your joint replacement surgery. So occupational therapy, um, we help people restore their function and regain their independence here specifically after you having your joint replacement for what we call activ activities of daily living or ADLs and 
instrumental activity of daily living, or IADLs. So what are ADLs and IADLs? Activities of daily living are things that you do every day, such as getting dressed, getting washed up, um, in and out of the shower or the tub, getting on and off the toilet, and hygiene care, you know, washing up, grooming, after toileting hygiene, um, just daily things like that that we do every day that we usually don't have to think of, but after having a surgery, um, sometimes we have to relearn because we may also have precautions that we need to adhere to in order to resume our function safely. Um, and then instrumental activities of daily living, or like I shared, IADLs, are other things that we also do daily. It could be caretaking for your pets, um, meal prepping, as we may have touched upon earlier, um, in terms of getting things prepared ahead of time, um, also doing your laundry, your grocery shopping, just those things, those daily things, and even your hobbies. Um, so we also help you getting back your independence or figuring out ways that you can manage so you can, again, continue to resume those things. Um, so for occupational therapy, you will have an evaluation either, typically it could be the afternoon of the day you have surgery, but sometimes it's the next morning as well. It depends how you feel, how late in the day it is, um, you know, a combination of factors. But we at least see you the morning after. Um, and then we decide our plan of care. We see how you're moving, how you're feeling, what your goals are to get you back home, um, to find out your prior level of function, and also like what type of help you have at home and what your home setup is like. Um, if you have a raised toilet seat that could help you on and off, or if you're gonna need a commode for home, um, if you have a tub shower or a stand-up shower, like there's all different factors that we look at and we work with you to help you to get home and regain your independence. Um, so you'll have those, you'll have the evaluation and then you'll have subsequent treatment thereafter for every day while you're in the hospital. We typically see patients one time a day for occupational therapy and the sessions could last anywhere as I would say from 30 to 45 minutes, but it depends on your goals and it depends on your prior level of function and your current level of function and how well you are doing and moving. While also, like I said, you may have some precautions post-surgery, so it depends how well you're doing adapting to those as well. So next, we're gonna talk about the different ways also that occupational therapy can help you to regain that independence. Um, not only by getting you moving and complying with those precautions, but we also help um, introduce some adaptive equipment. So adaptive equipment, you know, are going to be ways that you can, again, regain that independence, restore your function while maintaining those precautions. But we have different types um, of tools that you can use. So on the list here, you will see there's all different types of, you know, whether it's a reacher or a grabber, as we call them, a sock aid, a commode, a shower chair. There's different things that we will use to help you um, practice before you go back home. Now, something to remember is, or something to know, not remember, is that a lot of these things are not covered by insurance. Um, the only thing that typically can be with a script, um, and again, it depends on your insurance, um, would be the possibility of a commode. Um, and you don't have to worry about that right now. If you're in the hospital and we feel that you would benefit from one to help you, we'll go over that there. But everything else is not typically covered by insurance. So I wouldn't go ahead and purchase them ahead of time because you may not need them. Um, but if you do have family or friends that maybe have used equipment that's in fair condition um, in the past, you can feel free to talk with them. You may be able to borrow them. Um, if they can loan them out to you, that would be fantastic because some of this equipment may only be temporary while you have precautions. And some people end up needing them for a longer time because it does really help you um, in your daily function. Um, so whatever it is that you feel that you need before you leave the hospital or that we feel you could benefit from, um, we will make sure that we give you the resources to obtain that equipment. And that's pretty much it for occupational therapy. That's just a little overview. And we look forward to working with you and helping you with your recovery. Thank you. So once you go home, I'm going to send a prescription for your pain medicine as well as the blood clot medication to prevent blood clots to your pharmacy. I will confirm the pharmacy with you before I send it so that hopefully that prevents any issues with obtaining your medication. If you are workman's comp, please tell me in advance so that I can send the, pre the medication maybe a day in advance 
so that um, there isn't an issue in that layover period for workman's comp. Um, you'll be given an exercise program by the physical therapy and occupational therapy department for you to perform and you may receive a patient survey. We like to know how we're doing. Common experiences after surgery. So when I send you home, your knee is usually a little swollen and it may even have some bruising. But over the next two weeks, you will notice a significant amount of swelling and some bruising. That is normal. It usually can even come up above your knee or above your hip and it will come down your calf or come down your thigh due to gravity. Unless it seems out of the ordinary, like your entire leg is bruised and it's so swollen that it feels hard to the touch. In that case, um, you may want to call your physician earlier, but you will have a significant amount of swelling. Ice elevation are your best friends for that. You need to have lots of ice, lots of elevation. When we say elevation, I would like you to have it at least equal to where the level of your heart is. So up on two pillows, that isn't enough to cause severe flexion of your hip. Um, a recliner is perfect for that, but if you don't have a recliner, two, two pillows or lay across your sofa, put some pillows under your knee, put the foot on the arm of the sofa. That will work perfectly as well if you don't have a recliner. You'll ha in that dressing, that waterproof dressing, like I said, there is that central part that um, absorbs secretions and bleeding. When it absorbs it, it does turn purple. I don't want you alarmed by that. Everyone usually has a little bit of discharge post-surgery. Um, if the entire area in the center of your dressing turns purple and bulges out, it needs to be changed. And in that case, you'll need to call your surgeon and either go to their office or go to their urgent care and have that dressing changed. But you will probably see a, a fairly good amount of purple through there. But if it bulges or the entire thing is purple, then call your physician to have it changed. Keep an eye on that. Like I said, if it, if it looks like it needs to be changed, call your doctor. If you get a fever over 100.8, you should call your doctor. If you have nausea and vomiting and can't keep your pain medication down, you should also call your doctor. While you're on pain medications, you cannot drive a vehicle. The pain medications will decrease your reflex time. Even, even the, a small amount of pain medication will still decrease your reflex time. So until you're only taking Tylenol or Advil, there is no driving. In regards to car travel, it is recommended that if you're traveling in a car, every half an hour to an hour, you should stop and walk around for about five minutes just to stimulate your circulation and make it less likely that you'll get a blood clot. If you're going on an airplane, you need to speak to your surgeon. Most airplane travel post joint replacement is restricted until after six weeks. But do please do discuss this with your surgeon in advance. If an emergency arises and you have to fly, please call your surgeon for directions on what to do um, and what to look for because air, air travel really does increase your risk of blood clot tremendously. In the long post joint replacement, you'll have a fake joint in your leg. You will require oral antibiotics before any dental work. Your orthopedic surgeon will provide you a script for, for those antibiotics. Um, you will need to talk to the surgeon or the surgical PA at his office regarding how to obtain those prescriptions in order for you to see your dentist. Once again, before you come in, read and reread your guidebook. Follow the two to four week timeline. Get yourself and your home ready. Check your, check your seating. Check, get rid of the throw rugs. 
Don't get your floors waxed. Um, start your exercises. Eat healthy. Try to stop smoking or smoke less. So once again, I'm Cindy Borns. You're going to see me during your stay. Um, I kind of pilot your stay and I can help you with almost anything. So if you're having trouble um, and you're not sure who to talk to or how to get it fixed, certainly tell your nurse. Your nurse will call me as soon as, as, as possible. I will come up and talk to you and try to assist you with that. Okay? Well, can't wait to see you.